My name is Daniela, and I'm part of the marketing team here at Zetascale. Today, your host is Julian Enoch, our senior solution architect, uh, although most of you probably know him already. Uh, Julian, since I watched all your previous webinars, um, I know that you usually show us uh, demos and the actual code behind Zeno. Will you do the same yeah. this session? Yes, absolutely, Daniela. Yes, thank you. And uh, welcome everybody to this uh, new webinar on Zeno and uh, Robotic uh, for this time. And uh, yes, today I will show you uh, what we have new for Robotic in Zeno uh, with uh, uh, an example from uh, zero to deployment of uh, your, new, your new Zeno bridge for ROS2. So first, uh, an introduction on ROS2 and DDS, because a lot of people are using ROS2 and they know behind it's using DDS, but they don't know exactly the details and the implication of ROS2 with, with DDS. So DDS was chosen as a middleware for us too, as a main middleware for us too in 2014. And it was, it was chosen for good reasons. First, it was, it's because DDS is peer-to-peer -peer communication. So there is no broker, which is something similar to, to what uh, happened in ROS1. In ROS1, there was one uh, ROS master, but it was just used for discovery. And then all the ROS nodes were communicating peer-to-peer -peer, uh, with each other. So that's why DDS was also considered for ROS2 because of this peer-to-peer -peer communication between all the ROS nodes. DDS is also a standard, standardized by OMG, the Object Management Group, and it has several vendors and open source implementations. Uh, DDS is also already deployed in a lot of critical systems in like in defense, aerospace, finance. But you will notice that all those existing deployments are most for most of them on wired and controlled network with uh, low latency, high bandwidth, and no loss of communication. And that's working very well in this case. So DDS was used for us too. It's working uh, quite well in a lot of use cases. However, ROS2 users are still facing some challenges. And here, in this long text, I have extracted some uh, comments from uh, the user feedback from the ROS2 uh, middleware survey that uh, Open Robotics made in September this year. And you can have a click here. Uh, I will show you exactly the web page. So this is a web page uh, summarizing all the results of the survey. You have all the graphs that you probably have seen in the PDF report. But what is also very interesting is all the comments that user left here uh, to describe, for instance, here, all the issues faced and work around using ROS2 and technologies. And at the very end also, there are a lot of uh, miscellaneous comments. And in here, you can see, again, a lot of uh, issues that users have having with ROS2 using DDS. So what are those kind of issues? Here, I cat, uh, categorize the various issues we can see in the comments. And most are around five uh, related uh, topics of issues. First one is discovery issues. The DDS uses by default discovery over UDP multicast. And sometimes UDP multicast is not supported or badly supported. Or in the case of Luzi networks, it can create challenge, or if you don't have enough bandwidth, it can it can create challenge because discovery uh, protocol in DDS is very verbose. Issues over Wi-Fi, yes, because DDS in default uh, communication is leveraging UDP, and UDP you may have packet loss, you may have disconnection, you may have uh, lower bandwidth than on a on an Ethernet connection. So again, uh, this will end with issues with regard to the discovery protocol, for instance, because if you disconnect, if you're disconnected from your Wi-Fi, you will reconnect and the discovery protocol will occur again with all the other ROS nodes. And that creates again a lot of traffic that will uh, can also make the Wi-Fi tool be less responsive because all the traffic to, to be handled. Knowing that in Wi-Fi, you know, when you have collision of packets, there are a lot of retransmission. So that's had to, to the problem. Networking issues. Sometimes, like here, for instance, it's uh, very complex to configure the network because you may be, for instance, in Docker environment with network isolation. 
and it's complicated to tune DDS to um, to cope with uh, such network. And sometimes it's not just impossible. For instance, if you're in UDP, if you have a NAT, a network address translation, UDP would not be able to cross uh, across your, your subsystem. You may have scalability issues. So uh, we will see uh, that the core of DDS implementation requires a very um, detailed knowledge from all the participants across your system. And that leads to scalability issues the more you have participants, the more you have readers, writers, topics, the more you may consume a memory, the more you may send messages and so on. That's quite sometimes challenging in uh, losing networks. And finally, deployment complexity. Uh, yes, because for instance, the default protocol using UDP, you have each participant using different port numbers because otherwise they will collide, right? So uh, in Unicast, in UDP Unicast, each participant needs to, to find an available port to listen to the communication with other ROS nodes. And that leads to have some the impression that the port are, on, uh, are chosen randomly. And you never know which port is using your ROS nodes exactly, because actually it depends the number of uh, nodes that are started, and it depends the startup order also. So. This leads, for instance, to complexity and, and uh, to, for instance, to configure a firewall uh, with DDS. So all those issues, you probably uh, encountered such issues uh, using ROS2. And we know uh, from a very long time all those issues because, as you know, uh, at Zetascale, we have a very long experience in DDS. We are uh, co-inventors of DDS since uh, 20 years. And for instance, 10 years ago, we were working on a new product, uh, which was named Vortex Cloud or Vortex Link. And I was architect for this product. And it was uh, actually exactly a discovery server and a routing service for DDS. And we tried to play a kind of contortion to adapt uh, our product to the DDSI protocol, to the, for the DDS protocol, to be able to uh, forward all the messages, for instance, from one uh, subnetwork to another subnetwork. Uh, performing some change on the fly in the messages with regard to the locator, the IP addresses, the identifier of participants of GUID and so on. It was quite complex. It was already working. And actually, that's a solution that um, other DDS vendors are doing for, for their system, right? They are developing a discovery service, a routing service, the same way we did uh, 10 years ago. It works for some use cases, but it's still not really scalable. Uh, we had this experience, and actually, we, we don't no longer uh, support those Vortex Cloud and Vortex Link product because now uh, we really think our solution is um, our good solution is using Zeno. So, don't make me wrong. DDS is a very uh, nice product, but in very controlled network, right? We have, for instance, our colleague at Zetascale uh, implementing and developing Cyclone DDS, Eclipse Cyclone DDS are doing a tremendous job uh, to support DDS in very complex use cases, but still with a wired network where you don't have such a challenge like in a, in a Wi-Fi environment or to scale up to uh, the cloud, for instance. For such solution, so first an explanation of, of why um, DDS cannot really scale. Uh, there are some fundamental aspects of DDS protocol that uh, make it not really scalable on, or not suitable for open system. The first one is the discovery protocol. In DDS, all participants need to discover each other to establish peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. So this peer-to-peer -peer communication occurs um, at first via UDP multicast when available for discovery, but also for publication of message to, to several participants at the same time. But they still need to have point-to-point -point communication using Unicast. So they are leverage UDP Unicast. And then once uh, all the participants are, have discovered each other, they need to announce to each other participants the list of readers, of writers, and topics uh, they have with all the QoS for each uh, participant to perform QoS matching to know if I discover a writer on this topic I'm subscribing, is it really matching with regard to the QS and so on. So you can imagine that in a robot, for instance, uh, here uh, with a demonstration, I will demonstrate with a TurtleBot 4. In the TurtleBot 4, which is a small robot, 
I see already more than 700 uh, readers and writers to be declared, 700. And each participant in this robot need to exchange all information about their readers and writers. That uh, lead to a lot of ex messages exchange at uh, discovery time. And that's often, often the very first pain point uh, users are experiencing with uh, DDS over Wi-Fi, for instance, because the Wi-Fi sometimes on heavy traffic, you ha will have more uh, loss of messages because of collision, so more retransmission. Uh, if you have a lot of retransmission, uh, the network with Wi-Fi is, is less responsive, and the participant will uh, think that the connectivity dropped because they have a liveliness uh, heartbeat, for instance, which are lost. And so they undiscover again, and they try to discover, and so on. And it's very challenging over Wi-Fi, for instance, to have a, a stable discovery uh, time for, for robotic. Another point, for instance, is the reliability protocol. A reliability protocol in DDS, you have each writer that needs to know the state of each uh, matching reader. So it maintains the list of sent messages, wait for acknowledgement for each reader, and maintain for each reader a map of what message have been received and what message need to be retransmitted. So it means that as soon as you have one writer, you have uh, this my writer needs to maintain one state per reader it matches. That increases the memory consumption. And of course, with regard to the network for retransmission, it will increase retransmission because it uh, retransmit only peer to peer to each uh, reader. Liveliness protocol is another example. You, when you need liveliness, you, there will be extra messages sent between all the participants in your in the system. And there are some semantics also which are exposed uh, in DDS. You can know for each writer what are the the matching readers. Uh, you can see how many they are, uh, if they are alive, if they are gone. This also has a cost. You need to maintain all the liveliness between all the readers and uh, and their matching uh, writers. And that has a cost in terms of messaging and in terms of um, of memory. It can work in a very controlled environment and with a limited scale of readers and writers. But you can imagine that if you go to a large uh, system with uh, several robots in a in a cloud uh, environment, for instance, it will cause troubles. So, a solution for this is really to make DDS to scale with Deno. What does it mean? It means that uh, with Zeno, we will provide a bridge that can bridge the DDS traffic to Zeno. So we already, in the past two years ago, developed a bridge for DDS. And now we developed a new bridge that will, um, will interoperate with ROS at a higher level, so with ROS2 concept. And I will explain in detail what uh, this new bridge does. But the point is that you really want to scope all your uh, DDS in subsystems and interconnect those sub subsystems with Zeno, with Zeno routers, and sometimes with other Zeno applications or some other technologies applications that are bridged also by, uh, by Zeno. And you can build very complex uh, network of DDS subsystems uh, this way inter interconnected with uh, a Zeno infrastructure. So let's dive into this new uh, plugin for us too uh, over the DS that we, we made for, for Zeno. First, a view of what uh, ROS2 is doing when mapping to DDS. For each publication, uh, DDS uh, ROS2 declares, so for instance, a declaration of a publication on a topic slash TF, the ROS2 uh, middleware, so the RMW, is creating a DDS writer on a topic named RT slash TF. For a ROS2 subscription, there is a DDS reader on RT slash CMDVEL, for instance. Services. So for the services, either it's, uh, so it's leveraged uh, the RMW implementation of the services, which either Cyclone, either FSRTPS, they are using different implementation of services that make those, unfortunately, uh, incompatible. Uh, FastRTPS is using the RPC over DDS specification, while in Cyclone DDS, it's really the RMW Cyclone DDS, which is implementing uh, the RPC over DDS, the services over DDS. But the concept in, the in those two cases is the same. You have one topic for the request and one topic for the reply. 
So a service server, for instance, is creating one uh, data reader for on the request uh, topic to receive the request and one writer on the reply topic to send back the reply. An action is a composition of several uh, ROS interfaces. It's three services, one to send the goal, one to consent the goal, one services to get the result, plus two publication topic, one for the feedback and one for the status of the, the action server. So what it, it means really on DDS is that at each declaration of an action server and same as a symmetry in an action client, there are eight readers and writers which are created for each action. You can imagine what's the implication in case of discovery, and you know you can understand why in a, in a robot uh, like a turtle bot with some uh, with few actions and few services, we end up with several hundreds of uh, readers and writers declared in uh, in DDS. And for uh, in addition of this, ROS is also publishing one specific topic, which is uh, ROS discovery info. And this discovery info allows uh, ROS to reconstruct uh, the ROS graph. So what is published in ROS discovery info is really a mapping between the ROS nodes and uh, the writers and readers it declares. So really, all the construction of ROS graph depends on those two protocols. The discovery protocol for DDS all the declarations of readers and writers with their QSs and so on, plus this ROS discovery info topic to do the mapping between each nodes and each uh, readers and writers it declares. So what is doing the Zeno bridge ROS to DDS, the new bridge that we developed? Well, it just subscribed to all of this using uh, Cyclone DDS. It uh, subscribes and discovers all uh, the declaration of readers and writers uh, from all the ROS nodes in a, in a DDS system, in a ROS2 system. And it also subscribes to the ROS discovery info. So it's able to internally reconstruct the ROS graph. And then it will map all the communication, publications, subscriptions, services, and actions to uh, Zeno protocol. To, and for this, it maps a publication to a Zeno publication a DDS subscription to a Zeno subscription. But for the services and for actions, it will leverage queryable, Zeno queryable. So in Zeno, we have the notion of queryable. You can send a query to a queryable that will reply directly. And that's built in in the protocol, meaning that there is no need of one uh, publication for the re uh, request, one publication for the reply, no. It's directly uh, the, rep the queryable that send back the reply to the querier, uh, leveraging a breadcrumb mechanism in Zeno, where the, all the query are leaving some breadcrumb on the path of the query, and then the reply go, go back with the same way. This has also an implication. In DDS, we are using two topics, one for the request, one for the reply. Imagine you have uh, two clients for one server. The, those two clients are listening, uh, subscribing to the same reply topic. It means that when the server reply to one uh, service call, two, the two clients will receive the reply. And one will uh, just say, oh, that's not a reply for me. I'm dropping it. But still, it receives the reply. It receives some uh, IO messages to deserialize and to analyze just to drop it. That's a loss of uh, resources. With Zeno queryable, this won't happen, and that's already a save of, uh, of resources. So a service server is mapped with only one queryable for Zeno, which is very efficient on the wire, while an action server is mapped on only three queryable, one for send goal, one for cancel goal, one for get result. And we have the publication of feedback and status. And the bridge is also subscribing to ROS discovery info to internally reconstruct all the, the ROS graph. So when bridging, the remote bridge will uh, receive uh, all the subscription, will uh, forward all the publication, and will use get operation to query uh, from distance the queryables, the services, and the actions. And for the ROS discovery info protocol, uh, uh, the bridge are leveraging a new feature in Zeno, which is the Zeno liveliness token. 
a liveliness token in Zeno is a declaration any application can do on a free string. You can choose your string. And this is used to declare uh, the creation of something, anything you want. And the, this declaration of a liveliness token is tied to the session, Zeno session declaring this token. It means that any remote uh, Zeno session subscribing to this will be notified of the creation of the token. But as soon as it's disconnected to the distant session, it will also be notified of the dis disparation of uh, the liveliness token. So it will know the communication is broken with, uh, with the creator of the liveliness token. So in the bridge, we are using those liveliness token to really squeeze um, the, de the, the declaration of uh, discovery information to a remote bridge in, a, in just a, a short string. So uh, for instance, here you have uh, all the strings which are for declaration of a publisher, subscriber, a service server, a service client, an action server, or an action client. And contrary to DDS, where you need to declare all the readers and writers for an action, for instance, you have eight declarations for the eight readers and writers of an action. In the Zeno bridge, it declares only one string for uh, an action, which is really compact. So another feature very interesting that we have in the bridge is uh, the ability to specify a namespace, a ROS2 namespace. In ROS2, you can declare some namespace for all your nodes. Uh, but you need to do it, this for each of your nodes inside your robot and to do this for each robot if you want to have different namespace uh, for different robots. While with the uh, Zeno bridge, you can declare a namespace on the fly. So what it means, it means inside your robot, you don't need to configure any namespace. You configure the namespace in your bridge and the bridge will automatically add the namespace as a prefix to all Zeno key expression used to forward uh, the ROS2 traffic. And a remote bridge using the same namespace will uh, strip this uh, namespace and expose all the, the ROS2 entities, the topics and the services without the namespace. So you can have really two robots, for instance, which are totally isolated from each other and you can have teleoperation, which are not uh, mixing the robots all together. But at the same time, you can do uh, fleet management with a bridge, for instance, which is not using the same uh, namespace than the remote uh, robots. It means it will still expose all uh, the, the service and actions with the namespace as configured by the remote bridge. So here, for instance, you see the bridge bot one is adding on the fly uh, bot one uh, namespace. And on the fleet manager side, it exposed with the bot one namespace. And same for bot two. So here, the fleet manager is able to distinguish between the two robots. And you didn't need to configure anything in your robot, it's just uh, without any namespace. Just the bridge are configured. So what is new with this uh, new Zeno bridge for, for DDS? It's really have, um, with com when compared to the previous uh, bridge for DDS that we had, this new ROS2 DDS bridge has a better integration with the ROS graph. So now you can remotely uh, do a ROS2 topic list and you will see all the service topic list. You can see the service list. You can see the action list across the bridges. It has a better support of ROS tooling like AirVis, for instance. The services and actions are mapped on Zeno queryable, meaning, meaning it's uh, very well optimized. It's, uh, it has uh, less traffic than uh, the DDS ARPC mechanism, for instance. And it's uh, even more compact on discovery information thanks to the liveliness tokens. And as a plus, you can configure a namespace on the bridge on the fly instead of configuring this namespace on each uh, ROS node. So the use case uh, you can have, it's really all of this. You, it's the same use case that you, we used to have with uh, DDS Bridge, but with better integration with us to know. You can perform fleet management. You can perform record on replay. Uh, for instance, if you store all the commands in an InfluxDB database uh, with a Zeno router, you can have a Zeno application that query uh, the, what has been recorded in InfluxDB and replay everything in, uh, in another uh, robot, for instance. 
integration with all the plugins that Zeno um, uh, supports, like MQTT or REST, for instance. Publication subscription with MCU, but now also service call and action call or service uh, server uh, with um, with MCUs. We have some nice examples with uh, with Zeno Pico uh, on uh, ESP32, for instance. And of course, bridging across one between different systems that uh, might be behind a NAT. And in this case, you leverage a Zeno router in a public cloud, for instance, to perform the intercommunication. Okay, so let's do now the demo part with uh, Turtlebot 4. First, a view of what is uh, Turtlebot 4. It's based on uh, two things mainly. First, you have the, the platform, which is the CREAT 3 platform from iRobot, uh, the same as the uh, Roomba uh, vacuum, for instance. Uh, but without vac the vacuum part, and in, in place, in this vacuum space, you have a Raspberry Pi 4. And uh, there is a USB-C connection with Ethernet uh, over USB-C connecting the CREAT 3 and the Raspberry by 4. And this Raspberry by 4 is also running ROS 2 and is connected via USB to a LiDAR, a RP LiDAR, and a camera, uh, OAK uh, camera uh, with Wi-Fi. So you have really two systems inside the robot, two boards inside the robot, and those two boards are running some ROS2 nodes. In the CRAT3, you have all the, the ROS nodes for uh, to drive the robot, to drive the wheels, but also to drive um, some sensors, uh, like cliff sensor in the CRAT3. While in Raspberry Pi 4, you have all the ROS nodes managing the LiDAR, uh, the camera, and eventually all the SLAM uh, ROS nodes that you, you may uh, want to deploy in, uh, in Raspberry Pi. What we want right now uh, with this is really to have a um, DDS only inside the robot. So you configure uh, the TurtleBot as such. So there is a TurtleBot setup command that allow to have this menu. And in this menu, first, you can keep the ROS domain ID to zero. No problem with this because it's will kept internal to the robot. Uh, you need to change the RMW implementation to Cyclone DDS because the bridge is also using Cyclone DDS. So the interconnection will be far better if the ROS nodes and the bridge are using the same um, DDS uh, vendor, which is Cyclone DDS. And you configure a new uh, Cyclone DDS URI, uh, which is here on the right. And in this Cyclone DDS URI XML file, you configure uh, the network interfaces to be only USB 0 and the loopback address. And what will it, does it mean? Uh, the TurtleBot 4 setup will apply this XML file uh, for the ROS nodes running inside the Raspberry Pi 4, but will also make the same Cyclone DDS URI file available to the CRAT3. So all the ROS nodes in the CRAT3 will also use only USB 0 and loopback address for communication. So DDS, the goal here is really to have DDS running only inside the robot and not over Wi-Fi. Then you need to install Zeno on the Raspberry Pi 4. So I set here the link directly to the instruction to install it. So you can uh, go directly on the GitHub repository, download the package for the architecture you want. For Raspberry Pi, it will be ARM64, uh, Linux GNU target. You download it, you install it, uh, you just unzip it on uh, the Raspberry Pi 4. And you can start the Zeno bridge with a configuration file. And this configuration file I'm using for the demo is on the right here. So first, I, I start the bridge in uh, peer mode. I configure it to listen on uh, the IP address of the Wi-Fi. So here, this IP address is the IP address of my robot on the Wi-Fi. As a tip, I advise you to uh, configure a host name to your uh, robot. And if you configure a host name, you can replace this IP address with a robot host name and uh, the OS will automatically map the host name to uh, the IP address used by the Wi-Fi. So no need to, to look for the IP address since it might change depending on the DHCP. So that's for the Zeno connectivity. Then we have the configuration of the ROS2 uh, plugin. 
First, we set an ID, so that will be the identifier of the bridge. That's not uh, necessary, but that's uh, very useful uh, then to, uh, for instance, to to distinguish the bridges in the Zeno admin space and to perform some query on what have been discovered or what have been configured in the bridge. So here I set bot one as, a, as an ID. As a namespace, that's at the ROS2 namespace, I'm adding here the same uh, similar namespace, which will be slash bot one. And here, that's new in this uh, new bridge, you can uh, declare all the actions, uh, services, publications, subscription, which are allowed or denied. So here it's a deny list, meaning that all is allowed except this, the one which are denied here. So here I'm denying, for instance, ROS out uh, topics. I'm denying everything which is about parameters. And I'm denying also some underscore internal topics that are uh, used inside the CRAT3 and that are not supposed to be used by a ROS2 user of, uh, for TotalBot. So all of this will not be exposed uh, over Zeno. I'm also configuring some uh, done sampling for some topic because my Wi-Fi might be constrained. So I need to done sample some high frequency publication. So here, for instance, I'm setting up uh, the camera image to only 10 Hertz, the LiDAR scan to only 10 Hertz, and the IMU uh, publication to only 50 Hertz. That will save some bandwidth on my Wi-Fi. And as an option, I'm also activating the REST plugin uh, that we have in um, building in the bridge. So that's uh, to access HTTP uh, via HTTP uh, to Zeno publication and subscription. So once this configuration file is written, just start the bridge with minus C and the configuration file on the robot. On the laptop, I run a similar uh, bridge, probably uh, for another architecture. Here I, um, I have a PC on the X64. Uh, so the configuration is relatively similar, but with few differences. First one, it's not a listening endpoint, it's a connect endpoint. So here I'm connecting to my robot. So this bridge is connecting to the robot. Notice that you can configure the opposite way. You can have the robot connecting to a teleop uh, application, for instance. It's up to you to decide the initial way of TCP connectivity. But the point is that once the TCP connectivity is established, it's bidirectional. The data are flowing in the both ways. So here I'm configuring this uh, bridge to use the ID teleop and the namespace slash bot one, the same namespace than my robot. So all will be uh, exposed without namespace in the two ROS2 environments. But on the wire, on the Zeno wire, it will be using bot one, okay? Here, I'm also using ROS localhost only equal two. It means in my laptop, I want DDS to stay only on the loopback. Uh, that's to avoid confusion or uh, collision with, for instance, uh, a colleague who, who is running also ROS2. Uh, I, won't, I won't be messing up with his system and he won't uh, perturb my system. The deny uh, list, I'm using the same one than the, than on the robot, and that's it. And then with this, I, I can just start RVs using also ROS localhost only equal one because my bridge is configured to be uh, to use localhost only. So I start RVs with ROS localhost only equal one and I get uh, everything. So let's have a look and run this live. So here, for instance, I have, let me check if I am still connected. Yes, I am still connected. So here, for instance, I have two shells. This one is directly on my turtle bot, which is running just here. I will show it just after. So here I'm running the bridge with my configuration. And you can see already it's just in just one second, it discovered everything about uh, the ROS2 over DDS, publication, subscription, actions, uh, services, and so on. Okay, it's running on my robot. So now I'm running the one on my laptop here. And you can see also in only one second, all the discovery information from the robot. So here, for instance, I'm scrolling to the very beginning 
of the log. So here you can see the bridge starting up, it, it discovering some network interfaces and you can use those interfaces. You have a configuration of all the configuration and it's starting to discover all what is announced by the remote bridge. For instance, here, the remote bridge bot, bot one announces a subscriber on bot one slash scan and then a publisher on camera info and so on and so forth. So in only one second, I get all the discovery information from uh, my remote system from the robot. So what it means, it means that here, for instance, if I do already a ROS2 topic list, I can see all the topics which are running uh, remotely on, uh, on my robot. I can also list the services, for instance. I get all the services and I can list the actions. Without ACE and I get the actions. Okay. So now let's start RV. So here I'm starting RV with a prepared uh, file for configuration. RV is starting and I already get the LiDAR view and the camera view from my robot. So you can see, for instance, I'm just here. I'm moving my feet here and you can see the green, the green uh, dots which are uh, my feet. So let's now teleoperate uh, the robot. So here I'm starting a teleop twist keyboard. And now I can drive my robot. So this is my feet, this is my hand. I go here, I will take the robot. Here is the robot. And you can see it's quite uh, responsive, right? So here we have the view of all the office. And you can see it's very responsive. So here we are peer to peer in local with between my laptop here and the robot uh, over Wi Fi. Of course, you can have more complex deployments with the two bridges interconnected via a Zeno router deployed in the cloud. And you can imagine to have uh, the same setup, uh, but uh, to drive the robot or to teleoperate the robot from anywhere in the world, for instance, just with a, with a Zeno router. So that's how you can uh, set up uh, the demo. And that's exactly the demo we, we've made at uh, Roscon um, this year. So going back to the, to the slides, what's next uh, with um, the, the Zeno uh, and robotics? At first, uh, the Zeno Pass. Uh, you probably heard uh, some weeks ago that we started, uh, we launched a, a preview of uh, the Zeno platform, the Zeta platform. And what is this? It's really um, a platform as a service where you can configure all uh, you want as uh, VMs to run Zeno router in the cloud or on premises. So this platform you connect, you can provision uh, some uh, Zeno router to run in various uh, cloud providers. So for the time being, we only have AWS, but we will we'll add more cloud providers. And on AWS in different regions, you can uh, provision and generate automatically the configuration for various Zeno routers uh, interconnected all together. The platform will generate for you the configurations and the TLS certificate for MTLS, mutual TLS authentication between the routers, but also for your application. So we can also generate some configuration for routers, which will be deployed in your factory, for instance. So here, for instance, we have two Zeno routers, which will be deployed where you want in your factories. We won't uh, run those for you. You need to run it, but at least we generate all the configurations and the certificate for interconnectivity. That's already available. You can uh, try it uh, on demand. Just contact us. What we'll, we'll add for robotic in uh, very soon is the ability to generate also the configuration for the ROS2 bridge. 
it means you will, uh, from the platform, you will uh, be able to generate directly the configuration of the ROS2 bridge, the certificate to connect uh, your bridges, your robots to uh, the Zeta, Zeta platform, to the routers in the cloud. And you will be able also to monitor this to see if they are connected or disconnected. Also, uh, very big news uh, from a few weeks ago is that uh, there will be very soon a RMW uh, for Zeno. That's a work already in progress uh, by Intrinsic in, uh, in GitHub. It's uh, publicly, uh, uh, it's publicly uh, can be seen. And the target day, uh, release date will be for Jay-Z Jalisco in May 2024. Uh, we actively uh, support uh, the, this implementation on RMW Zeno, which will be based actually on uh, Zeno C. So we already made some uh, evolution in Zeno C to, to fit with, with the requirement of uh, RMW Zeno. And in the implementations, they are also reusing some ideas uh, that we had uh, in the Zeno plugin for us too. Uh, the queryable, the usage of queryable for services and actions, for instance, but also the liveliness token uh, to, to establish the ROS graph. And the goal for us is also to adapt uh, the ROS2 plugin, uh, the bridge, to allow uh, bridging between a RMW DDS system and a RMW Zeno system. What will it mean? It means that if you have uh, already running system using RMW DDS, you don't want to change it for some reason. Uh, with a bridge, just deploying the bridge, it will uh, be able to appear as a RMW Zeno based system, and it will be able to interact with some uh, ROS nodes using RMW Zeno at any distance, leveraging all the Zeno infrastructure. So that's it for this webinar. I'm really sorry about uh, the glitch that I had with um, my connections, uh, well, my, uh, my mic and the sharing screen. I hope uh, you get most of uh, my, uh, my talk. Anyway, if you have any questions or if you want any, uh, I, I re come back to some slide you, you missed, uh, just ask your question right now. I'm, uh, I'm listening. So, so what is the different first question from class from Jan? Sorry, Jan. What's the difference between DDS ROS2 bridge and DDS bridge? So the DDS bridge was really at DDS level. It doesn't, it didn't know anything about uh, ROS2. It was just uh, forwarding uh, uh, DDS publication uh, as Zeno publication and DDS uh, subscription as Zeno subscription. There was no, it was not leveraging the Zeno queryable, which was already, was already a, a big miss. So the ROS2 bridge now is leveraging a Zeno queryable, which is more efficient uh, over the Zeno network. And uh, also with regard to the discovery protocol, uh, it was forwarding only in forwarding mode. Uh, it was forwarding the full ROS discovery info, which was quite verbose. And here, the new uh, ROS2 bridge is leveraging the liveliness token, which is far more efficient. So in a way, the DDS uh, bridge was working relatively well for publication subscription. It was difficult to make it work with um, services and actions, and also with a lot of, of tooling that uh, required in ROS2 to discover uh, the, the readers and the writers. Uh, with ROS2 bridge is far more uh, efficient and it works uh, perfectly for all those, uh, those aspects. I don't see any other question. Okay, question from Vivek. Uh, does it combine discovery and routing service into one? Yes, absolutely. The bridge is performing the discovery uh, over DDS, is forwarding the discovery information to remote bridge in a certain way, and it's also routing all the DDS traffic from uh, for ROS2 publication, for service call, actions call, 
uh, via Zeno. So it's acting as both discovery and routing service. So thank you for your attention. I don't see any other questions. So if you have a further question, don't hesitate to join us on, uh, on Discord or to post a question or an issue on, uh, on GitHub on the repository of the bridge. Thank you. You're welcome, Damien. Thank you. Goodbye.